Welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. We aim to bring you the best macro analysis to help you successfully invest in financial markets. For our latest analysis, visit macrohive.com. We're getting great feedback from our members on our new weekly COVID vaccination report. It's probably the best global snapshot you can get on how countries are doing on the vaccination front. We've also just published a piece looking at how the most vaccinated country in the world, Israel, is performing on the economic front. Make sure to check these pieces out. And make sure to read some of our other excellent pieces that we published over the past few days. The topics range from things you don't know about China, to how to invest in the US infrastructure theme, and on whether equity markets are in a bubble or not. If you're not already a member, you can sign up at macrohive.com to get full access to all of these pieces, as well as our member Slack room, which contains a healthy discussion on markets and has a quite different flavor from what you get on Twitter. Your first month is free, and then it's only the cost of a few weekly cappuccinos. It's well worth it, and many call Macrohive the hidden gem for investors. So once again, sign up at macrohive.com. We're also proud to have Moonfair sponsor this episode once again. Moonfair believes exceptional investors deserve exceptional returns. Returns like those offered by carefully selected top-tier private equity funds, an asset class that has been for decades out of reach of most investors. And given the current volatility in stock markets, the spectre of inflation, low yields on most classic fixed income products, and the advent of all manner of unproven asset classes, Moonfair believes private equity has a place in every portfolio. No less than Fidelity International National, the global arm of Fidelity, one of the largest asset managers in the world, recently selected Moonfair as its exclusive distribution partner for private equity funds. A confirmation of Moonfair's obsession with picking the best fund managers and strategies across private equity buyouts, venture capital, growth equity. Moonfair also offers funds from top managers running strategies related to co-investment, infrastructure, secondaries, and credit. And nearly 1,500 investors have trusted Moonfair so far with their money, and the company is hurtling towards 1 billion euros assets under management. It recently launched a new and improved secondary market in partnership with Lexington, one of the largest private equity secondary fund managers in the world, giving investors the flexibility to exit their position before a fund's holding period elapses. So to get started, please visit moonfair.com forward slash macrohive. That's moonfair.com forward slash macrohive and create your free profile. There, you can also check out Moonfair's library of white papers exploring different topics around private markets investing, along with some of Moonfair's favorite episodes of the podcast. Completing a Moonfair profile is completely free and without any obligations, and will give you access to Moonfair's platform where you can see which funds are available, check due diligence documentation, and connect with Moonfair's Investor Solutions team. So I do urge you to go to moonfair.com forward slash macrohive. Not least, it will allow you to get to see how many of the leading private equity funds in the world operate. On this episode, I have Boris Vladimirov. Boris is a specialist in global macro and emerging markets. He's currently a managing director at Goldman Sachs. And before Goldman's, he was a partner and portfolio manager at Rockos Capital Management. He was also at Fortress, and he was a partner at Brevin Howard. Boris started his career on the sell side, which included working at UBS and Dresdner. Now onto my conversation with Boris. Hello and welcome, Boris. It's great to have you on our podcast show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Great. One thing, Boris, I like to do with all my guests is to get my guests to tell us a bit about their backgrounds. People like to hear people's origin stories. So, you know, from what you studied at university to where you are now, how did you get here from where you were at uni uh, all those years ago? Well, it's a long story. I mean, I was born behind the, the Iron Curtain. And, you know, grew up around the world, Middle East. My dad worked all his life for Dao Schwambeje in the old business. So uh, as a child, I remember vividly visiting the, the rigs and uh, how amazing, you know, people are very excited about going to Mars. You just have to do a trip in Sahara. I mean, it is absolutely exactly the same of what perseverance is. So, you know, there are in, in incredible places on this planet. But you said behind the Iron Curtain, which country was it? Bulgaria. Yeah, I was born, sorry. I was born in Bulgaria. So I ended up going back to Bulgaria to do high school. And as soon as, you know, I finished, the Iron Curtain actually came down. And so I moved to Austria for my studies. I, I became Austrian citizen eventually. And probably the most formative part of my stay in Austria was my studies at the Institute for Advanced Studies, which is a institution that focuses on postgraduate research. I was set up after the war by 
Morgenstern and Lazefeld, and basically had its own faculty, which is relatively small, but was inviting top professors from top institutions to teach and to do research. And I can tell a funny story. I was asking the, 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 the head of the economics department, how is it possible to get all those incredible names? And he laughed and said, you'll be amazed what two weeks in Vienna with tickets to the opera can do. As one of the advantages of being in Vienna, I guess, the cultural capital of Europe, if not the world, in some ways, yeah. Yes, so, so that's the story. And that, uh, I think that it is extremely important, practically, to, to understand what academia is doing, to keep close contact with academia, and to you know, draw inspiration, sometimes correction. But, but this element has kind of stayed with me, following the latest research papers, very closely and the, the thinking of key, key uh, university professors in various areas as kind of a good map of, of where knowledge about the world is and how it's evolving. And then, you know, after uni, I mean, was it clear that you would go into finance or were you unsure? Yes. Well, that's a, a, also a, an interesting story. I mean, I wasn't sure. I was thinking between finance and continuing making, making basically extended studies in political science with focus on fiscal policy and transition. At that time, transition was a hot, a hot topic. But what happened is, you know, it's trying you get those, those job offers. And I got the job offers in Kreditenstadt, which is a bank that doesn't exist anymore, but was the bank that triggered the Great Depression in the 30s. So it was the conservative Austrian bank, which then was taken over by Bank Austria, which was taken over by Heap of Rheins Bank, which was taken over by Unicredit. And obviously, it's still a lot of, uh, of good friends working there in Vienna. And that's, that's how, it, how it went. I started there. I moved on the, the, usual, the usual way. You move, moved on to Germany. I worked for Dresden Kleinwert and then to UBS London. That was that was kind of my bank track, so to say. And of course, in the mid 2000s, you had tremendous opportunities in risk taking. Pre Lehman, you know, the banks were playing as large hedge funds. So it was uh, quite peculiar that you know a newly formed hedge fund approached me, and I I was fairly intrigued, not so much by by the opportunity to be a trader in a hedge fund. But by that time, I, I had moved already from. Uh, research to trading. So I was, I was trading at UBS, but mostly uh, being very impressed by the person who approached me to, to join the team, which was Trifon Nazis, the, the EM, PM, and, and the N in Brevon Howard. And I must say Trifon continues to be one of the dearest friends and, and a person that I have learned a lot from and a mentor, a friend. So, so it was a tremendous experience. I mean, these years at Brevon Howard were simply phenomenally good in so many aspects. And it's probably the longest bit of my uh, kind of work journey in one place, with almost nine years. And you, and you said, you know, working with Triffin and, and just the Brevin experience was very formative for you and, and allowed you to grow. I mean, what were some of the things that, from, from an investing or trading perspective, that really stood out for you in terms of what you learned or, or you refined during your time there? I would say the extremely smart way the firm was organized in a way that it was deploying capital in concentric circles, allowing relatively small or young PMs to run their book and grow and increase the size of their book as they grow, while at the same time serving with trade ideas and interacting with a bigger PM, helping manage a bigger capital pool altogether. So I, I would say this was a very collaborative, very open culture of exchanging ideas and views very horizontal in a way of open debate and no kind of intellectual humility, I would say, with a lot of external expert advice. So all the, all the right things to try to come to an unbiased view of the world in, in purely Bayesian way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, then after Brevin, you went to Fortress, I think it was, and Rocos, I think. Is that right? Yeah. So, so what happened is after I left Brevon, I took some time off, uh, returned. I was in Geneva at that time. And then I joined, I joined Chris, where basically we, do, we did quite some work to, to kind of start and put the, the research and the foundation and process of, of investing in EMs as well at RCM. This was also a very interesting, good experience for me. I developed interest in certain areas, which was probably different from traditional macro at that time. And it was more trying to turn to the area of artificial intelligence and systematizing the domain-specific knowledge which I have acquired over the years and trying to formalize that and produce a more structured quantitative process where 
the macro triggers are incorporated into a broad framework across liquid assets and can be applied on a new, I would say, non-human decisionary platform or way of managing assets. Uh, this has been a very interesting journey so far with working to develop things and also to catch up with all the new things that happen in the area. So I'm fairly optimistic about, about the process and the work there. It is something which I do now my, mostly in my free time because I'm focusing on other stuff in my, my day job, given how lively emerging markets are at the moment. But whenever I have a free moment, I, I definitely spend some time on it. Yeah, yeah. Perhaps we'll come back to the AI stuff a bit later in, in our conversation. And at the moment, you're at Goldman's. And what's your focus at Goldman's? Yes, uh, the moment I am market strat and I focus on practically macro views, trade ideas, anything that is relevant both to the trading team. So I'm not part of the research, I'm part of the global markets division. And I focus on supporting our client base with interpretation of current events, but also with forecasts and with more strategic views as well as tactical views. Yeah, yep, yep. No, that's great. Excellent. You know, there's, there's a lot to talk about. You know, I think it's probably useful to have some context around our conversation. So what, one thing perhaps is that we've obviously had the whole COVID crisis for the past year now, and that's this has been an unusual shock to the economy. You know, historically, typically you get global recessions after inflation-led tightening of uh, policy, or it's usually some kind of crisis, financial crisis, that's what triggers a recession. This time it's been different. So, I mean, how, how are you kind of looking at the past year and how you're looking at the reflation trade that people are talking about at the moment? Yes, I mean, it is been indeed exceptional time. I think the one way which I do like to characterize shocks is by the fluctuations in the relative balance sheets. Uh, so I have a quasi Minskian approach to looking at things uh, in macro perspective. And what we have had is we've had basically tremendous contraction of private demand and tremendous uh, unprecedented fiscal expansion. And as a result, and you can see that in the IMF risk analytics on the balance sheet side, we have had a substantial deterioration in public sector balance sheets and at the same time a substantial improvement in the balance sheets of households, banks as well. And what's interesting, in the last six months since October, also for corporates, corporates initially were deteriorating, flagging red, but now they are improving. And this is what you would expect over a sustained fiscal expansion that you will basically tilt the balance sheet quality towards improving private sector. And that has obviously implications for the future. I think there is some way of differentiation. What does that mean to inflation? Obviously, at the moment, especially on the macro-systematic factor side, the, the leading factors show a very strong inflation impulse, and which, which will persist in the second quarter. And there I see actually a bigger chance of surprise relative to what the market expects in Europe rather than US. In US, everybody is expecting inflation to pick up. But, but the correlation with that signal of European inflation actually is stronger. And I would be looking at the inflation numbers in Europe more strongly. Of course, that inflation spike will be transitory by the very nature of post-crisis amplitudes in the system. You have a big shock, also very synchronized globally, which is also quite unprecedented. So you do have basically a declining wave function. And it is possible that the first quarter of next year, we might be staring at the other side of the coin and saying, oh my God, growth is weak. We have fiscal cliffs. And all of a sudden, all the inflation concerns are gone. We're worried about deflation again. Again, I think that this can happen. It depends a lot on whether there'll be additional fiscal padding, given that we have midterm election in US in 2022, that is fairly likely and possible. I mean, the US fiscal cliff is the largest in the world next year, about 8.7% of GDP. So I cannot see that taking place in an unmitigated way. It is probably likely to expect another fiscal package sometime next year. So, and then comes the 23-25 period, which I think is very important period. And I think that uh, by that time, the employment gap will definitely be closed. Right. Plus, my econometric work points towards a strong relationship on eight quarters between fiscal impulse and inflation. So by 2023, the 21 fiscal stimulus should be getting that lagged effect kicking in. And if we even get more fiscal next year, that will kind of accumulate. 
So the picture 2325 can be looking different and we might be seeing a more sustained pickup in inflation, not only in US, but everywhere. If you look at OECD inflation and you do any type of long-term non-linear trend process, you see that probably the low in OECD inflation was in 2017 and we have turned the corner. And there is a good reason to expect that global inflation over the next two decades probably will be higher or be trending higher relative to the previous ones. And these reasons, I mean, I'm sure you have discussed with many of your guests relate to demographics. They're related to the more generous use of fiscal and monetary policy to stimulate private demand. And they are also related to a certain extent by the problems that arise with uh, climate change and how we tackle that. Yep, yep, yep. That all makes sense. And, and just a few kind of follow-up questions. On, on the European inflation side, I mean, you kind of have two almost not consensus views. One one is to focus on European inflation in the in the near term as, as the, the big kind of swing market almost rather than say US and then the kind of the longer term story as well. On the European side, I mean, how much of that is kind of more technical in nature? You know, so for example, the you know tax cuts that you know, have been uh, removed that feeding through into German inflation now and some of the methodological changes in the composition of European CPI, you know, which has kind of raised some of the numbers. How much is, is kind of those sorts of one-offs rolling off or coming into effect? And how much is true inflation, if you see what I mean? The impulse that I talk about is completely actually non-technical. It is based on the price uh, indices of the PMIs. Uh, it's, it's a bunch of factors. It is the commodity, the broader commodity impulse, not just oil. So that, that impulse is very strong. Obviously, the, 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 the factors which pick up more on the output gap or employment gap, they are still relatively benign. So that's why this amplitude is likely to realize and it's not going to be staying also in Europe, right? I, I don't say that we, we're going to go up and stay there. It's going to be up and down. But I think, again, the situation in Europe is very different from 2008 to 2015. And the main difference, which I'm not sure if it's well understood, is in the banks. If you think about European banks between 2000 and 2008, they were all over the world. They were the biggest lender on trade credit. They were involved in Asia. They were involved in Latin America. The balance sheet was almost 35 trillion, as far as I remember, right? So 350%. They had to basically, between 2009 and 2015, they had to make a big deleveraging program. And capital was also very low in Europe. So that had to be increased as well. So if you look at employment gains in Europe relative to US, European employment, was nowhere for most of the 2009-2016 period, right? But after the banks cleaned up and we started having a credit impulse after the latest kind of commodity shock or weakness 2015-16, the 2016-18-19 period, European employment was growing at the same pace as US employment, right? So where are we now? European banks are in better initial condition, there is some overhang from COVID, but there has been also a big fiscal transfer, right? So European employment is only 3 million below the pre-COVID high. US employment still has 8.5 million to catch up, right? Now, with European employment, the data comes slower, it's quarterly, it's harder to monitor. We cannot get excited every week or every month, right? And that there is a bit of a, an attention uh, element there. But we should be paying attention on how things will develop once the COVID wave is over once vaccination succeeds. And there is some delay there. So I don't say that Europe can run ahead or faster than US. But again, again in this 23-25 period, I would be thinking more about Europe actually surprising in a different way than the 29-2015, right? That's, that's, so the, the track, the relative track can be a lot better. Yep, understood. And then in terms of the longer term inflation outlook, you know, you talk about it takes time for all the fiscal stimulus to to kind of feed through and we'll really see the effects of that fully 2023 20, onwards. Some of the counterpoints to that, you know, from you know my perspective or from the sort of the perspective here is one question mark is how much 
balance sheet repair is the private sector going to continue to do? You know, so in in that sense, how Ricardian, you know, is all the fiscal stimulus? You know, so that that's kind of one question. The other one is is around technology, which is you know there is this argument that the world is graying or aging, but one could argue that you know technological change will actually will kind of make up for the lack of working age sort of population, whether it's robots or software, all of those sorts of things. You know that that there is this kind of replacement that that will go on. So you won't see some of these dynamics that people are talking about in terms of age. Sort of population. And then, then the third point, which is kind of related to that, is that COVID is, is unusual in the sense that it, it really hit the service sector. You know, cyclically, normally it's a manufacturing sector that, that you know, is, is a big cyclical component, but this time it's a service sector. And unusually, you know, over this period, we've had a, almost like a year where the service sector has had to find ways of functioning without people, you know, or with people having to sort of behave very differently. And given that the sort of the bulk of inflation is services inflation rather than goods inflation, isn't it an argument that we'll now see these disinflationary forces that have attacked the manufacturing and the goods sector now come into the service sector from a kind of a structural perspective going forward? So these are some of the sort of the factors I've been looking at to kind of try to understand the sort of the persistence of inflation. Yeah, I mean these are these are great questions and let me start with the offsetting impact of the private saving on the fiscal or the Ricardian equivalence. It's very interesting. I, I posed exactly the same question to uh, Jason Furman two weeks ago. And my question was the following, basically. Look, we had 13% US personal saving rate in Q4 last year, and it jumped to 20.5% in January. And it was, so first quarter is tracking at around 15%. Obviously, today's retail sales number was very strong, so a bit lower than that. But isn't that a good example of, or a good lead to think that there is some Ricardian equivalence? And he laughed at me and said, well, nobody really believes about in Ricardian equivalence anymore. But I don't think I agree with that. I think that, and again, I'll, I'll quote what, what Jason said himself. He said that out of the 5 trillion of stimulus, they probably think that 1 trillion went straight to the top 1%. Now, think about the ergodicity problem, right? We do have a substantial income differentiation in this crisis. And the top one or the top five or the top 10%, they have benefited disproportionately in that period. And, and the, there are certain implications of that. Number one is that their saving rate is high. So income going to those segments would automatically increase the saving rate in the system. And if that continues, it does not necessarily mean that the saving rate is going to normalize very quickly. So there would be a process as the jobs are recovered that the income basically starts moving more towards the consuming part of the population and the average saving rate start normalizing. The paradox, with particularly with US, and IMF has done some research on that, is the average matters for the saving, but in terms of fluctuations in consumption, in terms of growth, the top 10% optimism and consumption matters most in explaining boom in consumer demand. They are creating the maximum. Yes. So if there is a tax hike in US on incomes above 400K, the Ricardian equivalence argument and will end potentially some higher savings. So it means that eventually beyond the initial reopening surge in retail sales or in consumption, you may have some, some weakness, which would be the consistent again with a more benign view in the second half of this year, beginning of next year. Now, the question then is how fiscal reacts and how politics reacts, because it becomes a political decision. And I see uh, uh, an attention and a possibility from the current administration to try to direct more income towards the, the, the lower percentiles. This is the big agenda. The big agenda is to rebuild the, the, uh, the income of the working class in America in order to stabilize politics in, in, in the first place, but also to create a more equitable uh, society. And that is a big project. And I must quote Larry Summers, obviously imprecisely, just from memory, but he said that it is very, very important what Biden was saying ahead of announcing one of the fiscal programs, that basically democracy is put under the test whether it is the better form of government, right? And this is this is where the, the great power competition with China comes in. The big political question or political economy question of our time is, do you need freedom to achieve prosperity? Or 
do you have to do a trade-off between freedom and prosperity, right? And and the whole clash of the liberal versus the anti-liberal modes of, of thinking is on that particular point, right? And again, I must say that the liberal part has taken taken a hit, but it is definitely going to come back. I'm, I'm very optimistic about that. And the hit is very clear. In the COVID crisis, the country that gained 3.5% relative share in global output, which is massive, is China. And the country that lost 2.5% in global output, which is also massive, is US. So this is, this is what has happened in the aftermath of this crisis. And that means that US will have to keep pressing the pedal of support and will have to be focusing on encouraging growth and, and maintaining strong growth. Now, is that a reason to qualify that as US exceptionalism? I find it harder to, to go on that qualification because it does involve a lot of debt creation and a lot of fiscal spending, which is a nominal shock rather than a real shock. And I find exceptionalism more as a exceptional productivity growth, which is, of course, then currency positive, while the exceptionally high growth because of fiscal is not necessarily currency positive because it widens between deficits. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll I'll come back to your point about freedom versus prosperity. I think that's a really good topic, and and you know, with your upbringing as well, you you kind of see in all sides of this. But you know, the the other point I uh, you know I, I mentioned around sort of demographics versus like people versus robots that the robots will replace you know the aging population, and then also the changes in the service sector. What, what about those two arguments for? Oh yeah, absolutely. This is very important as well. Yeah, I think look, uh, obviously automation is happening. The COVID crisis has catalyzed shift towards Towards more automation, uh, for sure. And on the other hand, you do have the kind of the medium long-term pressure points, which is particularly how we deal with the aging population, how we provide the public services to an aging population, where employment of humans is still the relevant factor. And generally, I think I am supporter to the idea that whenever you have a high productivity shock, which is, I think, the BOMO principle, Whenever you have a high productivity shock in a segment in the economy, it paradoxically deflates itself relative to the size of the whole economy. Take, for example, agriculture. Agriculture, if you, if you, if you could travel back in time 200 years and you, could tell, you, you would tell the people, look, don't worry that you know, there, there, there may be some changes in, in uh, the way people produce their food, you might not be employed all in agriculture, like 70 or 80% of the population. People would think you're crazy, that it's impossible to produce all the food to, to feed so many people. And what happened actually is that agriculture now employs only 1% of the labor force, but produces 4 to 5% of output, right? So which is tremendously productive, but it has shrunk relative to the rest of the people. So what is happening is manufacturing after the war, it was around 45, 50% of the economy. And now it's kind of asymptotic 25. So you can have a world where manufacturing actually shrinks down to 5 or 10%, but you have all this tremendous, huge economy, which is half public quasi or private public services to an aging population, and the other half is completely virtual, right? And this concept of virtualization clearly creates a challenge in how we think and how we measure inflation, right? Because obviously, both money and prices become very elastic notions because the limitations of supply are, are falling away apart from the supply of programmers, for which I can tell you there is strong wage growth and there is inflation for sure. But then uh, you have to really segment what I mean is you have to segment the industries. And I do think that there will be higher demand for services for aging population and that those prices will have to go up. And I, I want to open a quick bracket there. And I think that a very important policy priority, which I see as the things that can be exciting over the next 10 years, is the tokenization of labor. We are talking about the tokenization of money, obviously, is an absolute fact. We started tokenizing intellectual property, which I think is, is a great beginning to overall tokenization of labor. I think that tokenization of labor will allow for a very smooth pricing of labor based on skill and based on experience in a way that will create substantial efficiencies and will be able to reward more directly larger chunks of labor and diminish the dislocations which are happening because of the natural rigidities in the labor market. So there can be a massive technological breakthrough that can 
solve to a certain extent or maybe to a large extent some of the key political economic problems that democracies are facing, which is with the substantial differentiation in income. And that is probably a theme that is very kind of broad and uh, very early days, but, but it is quite exciting because if you make prices of labor more flexible, you're also changing uh, the macro environment in its own, right? And that also reduces the macroeconomic volatility altogether and creates more smooth. uh, So you you can reduce the cyclical volatility to a certain extent by that, and it can strengthen economic growth, can strengthen final demand, all the things that have been an issue in the last 20 years. Yeah, they're they're really kind of good points. And we could talk more about those, but for the sake of time, and, and before actually we go on to talk about emerging markets, your point about inflation in Europe, I mean, what what are the market implications of your views here? I mean, look, I think that clearly Japanization of Europe has been a very well entrenched theme and view. So you would definitely think that financials can benefit in, in such environment. I The curve steepness can be more sustained. Some people might even think that ECB could have a chance to get out of the negative rate hole at some point, right? So it might be a, a premature assumption, especially given the current account surpluses and the impact that can have on the currencies if the market start pricing it, right? But again, it is not an impossible assumption if that happens. So yeah, it should work on the currency, let's say, in a different way that high inflation would work on the dollar. And the main reason is because ECB is in the negative rate corner, and if any flexibility that can allow to move away from that negative rate corner will be beneficial for all assets and the currency as well. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Now, on emerging markets, one of the debates has been around the impacts of higher US yields. Now, of course, in recent weeks, yields have stabilized and started to move a bit lower. But in general, we've had an environment of rising yields, steepening, say, US curve and then other curves. And there's this debate around, is that good or bad for EM? So what's your view on that? I like to work with priors based on econometric estimates. So, and they are just priors. I mean, we always have to adjust new information and add to them, right? But they are robust in a way because they're based on, on some relationship that existed in the past. So, The econometrics tells you that the two and the five-year real and nominal rates are the real risk for emerging markets. The 10 and the 30 nominal and real rates, if they go up, they do not necessarily point. Actually, the coefficient on the 30-year real rate is the other way. So the higher it is, the better for risk and for yen. So having said that, if you measure the volatility of the move, then the volatility a large repricing is disruptive. But what is interesting is if you take a conditional distribution since 95 and you say, okay, what happens in the three months after a big repricing of US 10-year yield, at least 70 basis points or at least 100 basis points in the 10-year real yield, is you see that in that segment of three months after such repricing, actually risky assets and EM did quite well. So the dollar weakened on the margin The credit spreads tightened and credit did well, and EM local bonds even did well and so on. So again, I think now after big repricing in Q1, we are in this kind of sweet spot. And if the market starts focusing on the US fiscal cliff next year, we could have a more benign environment for EM over the next six months. Of course, with EM, there is one reason why EM is the hardest asset to trade is that it does have these unstable and time varying sensitivities to multiple factors. So it is basically like an engine where all the pistons can fire at a different time and you have to figure out how to put them together to create a steady torque, right? It doesn't happen naturally. So you are either in a US kind of dominance of the betas or you have idiosyncratic or you have commodity and so on. So for EM to work well, you you need to have all stars aligned. Right? You need to have weak dollar, you need to have dovish Fed, no volatility in US rates, strong commodities, and domestic side must be looking good. Right, So there are issues in a number of the large EMs that probably create points of tension, which also create opportunities, of course. It just means that you cannot have a kind of a blind long, but this is, again, we've been saying this is a trading year. It's not a buy and hold year. Yeah. And how does China fit into this? You know, obviously, China, as you mentioned earlier, did very well last year, or 
you know, relative to other countries, for sure. And then this year, there's there's some concerns, you know, that the authorities there are focused a bit more on deleveraging, that the credit impulse will start to come down a bit, you know, and, and the mood music from China just seems like they just are focusing on cleaning up balance sheets much more. Yet the PMIs look all quite strong, you know, import numbers recently were very, very strong. You know, what, what's your view on China and then its impact on EM? China has played very conservatively the COVID crisis. So their stance basically has been, let's provide the minimum necessary support, while at the same time, take the positive impact from the fiscal impulse or fiscal spillover from the fiscal which everybody else will do, and use that to indeed deliver and stabilize the system. This has been the playbook. And the main monetary policy element of that is that China did not expand the money base at all in this crisis. I mean, G- G4 have on average expanded money base by 45% year on year. EM on average by 26% year on year. Both of these are way beyond the inflation or nominal growth, right? China is at zero. So they, they have kept the base of the pyramid very tight. But at the same time, they still do have a sizable fiscal deficit, right? I mean, the the IMF estimate of the consolidated Chinese deficit is in the double-digit area, right, on a consistent basis over time. So what you what you are seeing in China is this environment which was in the pre-Lehman period in the West. You have a limitations on the narrow money, but a growing pyramid, inverse pyramid out in, in, the, in the monetary components. And that situation creates the need for very increased high velocity of the narrow money component. And in that context, you might have outages where somebody has a problem to refinance, right? So given what is happening with Huarong, which is a very important development, I mean, having one of the big consolidation asset managers who has been priorly, practically key to sort out the 97 bad debts and is a, is a large borrower, 77 billion renminbi. Having those bonds going down 50, 40, 50 points from investment grade, right, is a major spillover risk into local government debt. And I think the sovereign is going to probably support that. It's not going to let that fail because the spillover risks are too big. But it is exemplary that such events can happen, right, in such environment, because it is a tight money environment, right? Now, the response function of that is either you do uh, the targeted recovery and you help the the borrower in distress, or you start easing the monetary base and you start easing the money side. Now, China can afford to do both, and we we have to see which way they're going to go. It's, it's hard to say. One thing, I must note one thing, is in the next five-year plan, I was expecting for them to remove the growth target. Because if they were really focusing on deleveraging and value-added growth and technological advancement and change, they could have scrapped the growth target. Simply because when you have very high capital-to-output ratio, if you want to maintain high growth, you need to keep investing at a very, very high rate because your depreciation rate becomes a big headwind, right? If you calculate it correctly. I mean, Japan must invest 20% of GDP just to stay unchanged, right? So China probably is moving into that capital to output ratio. And my calculations are that Chinese growth will have to asymptote towards 3% in in the second half of that decade from from the 6% that we've seen. Now, maintaining the 6% that goal, for me, tells me that China, again, is in a mode of great power competition and that they will be doing the necessary to keep the economy growing and to keep investment stronger and they have their priorities. So I think that policy will not be too deleveraging. So obviously now the credit impulse is going to slow down somewhat, but I do not think that it is going to craterize or that we're going to have a big, like crushed, crushed impulse. And then the lead from China credit impulse to the rest of the world is about 12 to 18 months. So it is quite a long lead, right? By the time the China, China slows down, we might have the nominal reflationary impulse in the West 23, which I was mentioning, which will overall be supportive again for EM because it is good for commodities. It will play out in the typical mid to late cycle effect 
that it has on growth assets, EM, trade volumes, and so on, right? So that will probably allow China to to have a bit of a slowdown and then then come out of it. And what does this mean for the renminbi? You already kind of alluded to a weak dollar view, and with them having tight money, that implies a stronger renminbi. Is that fair to say? At the moment, it is strong. It is actually, if you look at the real effective exchange rate ranking of BAS, renminbi is the strongest currency in, in real, real effective exchange terms for the past 20 years. So... So definitely strong. I mean, China has marked or achieved substantial productivity gains in that period. So we can. it's hard for us to take it one-to-one as it is it massively overvalued. And it's still running a current account surplus, right? So, but I would say it is strong. And one thing that I have to mention there is in a world where inflation is going up, the incentive for reserve accumulation is changing considerably because reserves are mostly invested in bonds. In bare bond market with higher inflation, it is less or weakening currencies it is less reasonable to accumulate a lot of public sector reserves. So the recycling we would have seen happening this year in China is shifting towards the private sector. The private sector is given the green light to basically accumulate more foreign assets, either repay foreign debt or invest more abroad. So that all together is another positive development, how the reflationary period, if the world is turning towards higher inflation expectations, will again be positive for emerging markets because that money that was put in the developed market fixed income is going to actually be recycled in a different way that goes in real assets. Some of that will end up as FDI or as investment in equities or credit in emerging markets. Yep, yep, understood. And and how about China bonds? I mean, this has been a big story for vet investors, you know, Chinese yields all on 10 years, like 3.2%. In a world where yields are so low for, you know, large economies, that sounds very attractive. I mean, do you think from a strategic perspective, it makes sense to, you know, allocate to China or Chinese bonds? Well, definitely, it's a large bond, bond market, and it's getting included in a number of indices. So investors have been allocating. What we have seen is kind of sequencing where there was a big inflow last year, which kind of petered out towards the end of December. It was also coinciding with the strength in the renminbi. We now think that there can be a period where yields actually can go up. And the main reason is that PPI is running very strong in China. If you look at the three-month annualized, it's around 14%. So headline is 4.4. So we can have 8% PPI. Historically, PPI has much stronger correlation with, than CPI with the bonds. Obviously, on CPI terms, real yields look very attractive, but CPI is going to be going up as well because of the food prices, which are rising globally, right? So I think domestic investors who are the big driver in the bond market, they look more at PPI. And if PPI is heading towards, say, that will imply maybe 50 to 70 base points higher yields in the 5 to 10 year segment. So once we see, if we see, and once we see that repricing, clearly the next wave of bond buying around the FTSE Russell inclusion should start from October. We may see it starting a bit earlier, so that will be probably a better level to add to the, to those bonds. Yeah. And in terms of some of, if we kind of round off our EM conversation with a, a few of the more interesting EM markets, Turkey is one, you know, we've had a change of central bank governor. It came as a surprise to me, at least. I don't know if you were expecting that or not. So it seems like Turkey's kind of going back to some of its old ways. Then we have Brazil, you know, which has ongoing kind of COVID issues and pension debt issues. Russia recently, you know, some political sort of noise and sanctions and so on. And now India, which seem to have a really good story until it's very recently, the whole COVID story is kind of really gone out of control in some ways. So, you know, th- those kind of the four interesting EMs right now, I mean, what's your take on the, each one of those? So on Brazil, I think very quickly that there is value in the external debt. I think the credit spreads are too high relative to the level of reserves. Obviously, there are fiscal risks. The premium in the bonds relative to the ISO, the bond default premium is very low. And that is why it's unlikely that you see big real money involvement in the bonds before that. So there's very high default premium, about 35% on 10-year external debt, and there is only 4% default premium on the bonds. That's not very consistent, given that most of the domestic debt actually is uh, on the domestic, most of the debt is on the domestic side, and the reserves relative to foreign debt are very high. Right, so you you would expect those probabilities to be the other way around, yeah. And I'll I'll put South Africa in here. But South Africa is very interesting because it's exactly the other way. In South Africa, actually, you have a domestic 
bond default premium at 500 basis points in the nine year, one year forward. On top of that, you have, or just below that, you say you have another 500 basis points of inflation premium, which is totally logically inconsistent because if inflation is going to surprise 500 basis points above the 10 year average policy rate and come to 10, 11%, that will reduce your debt to GDP by 50 percentage points because inflation and primary balance are the opposite sign in the debt stability equation. So in South Africa, there is ex- extreme risk premium in the local bonds, and it compares very differently to Brazil. On Turkey, look, I mean, Turkey has been pursuing a nominal growth policy without strong focus on productivity enhancement. And this usually leads to deficits and weak currency. This is kind of the textbook consequence. Now, in that process, however, and of course, higher inflation. I mean, this is the textbook consequence of of nominal growth targeting without productivity enhancement. And in this process, I think the AKPM and the president, President Erdogan, they have realized that high inflation actually is a liability because it is reducing their political support because actually the base, the political base is not in the upper income part of the population, but it's in the in the, the lower income part, which is unhappy with higher inflation. And when I look at fiscal revenues that are growing at 30, 35% year on year in a crisis year, I think that probably 15, 16% CPI is probably not the, the correct number. So we see that popularity of AKP is following the new pro-Republican, actually, and pro-parliamentarian form of government party, the the good party, is going up. And uh, this is obviously um, a matter of concern for the president. And they have been deciding, basically, they made a decision to move towards an orthodox policy in order to stabilize inflation, which was taken very well by the markets. They gave him the full benefit of the doubt. But then came this decision to change the central bank governor. And it's not very clear what is the incentive of that decision, but I think that instead of very quick reduction of interest rates, which many people feared, and as we saw today, they didn't basically cut, instead of the quick reduction of interest rates, they might decide to actually do more QE or more balance sheet expansion in order to support the growth impulse, albeit at a higher rates price, right? Which given the level of inflation is still not that high or the potentially latent inflation in in the system, right? And we get 50% money base growth. So I am concerned about the sustainability of the central bank balance sheet, the low level of reserves. We have this metric, which is total gross assets relative to net foreign assets that measures the ability and the space, gives fiscal space to do QE. And Turkey has obviously dropped a lot on that metric. So, So we remain... We remain cautious. Obviously, external debt is relatively low. The external bonds, the back end, there you can argue that there is some value there, given that uh, external debt to GDP is only fifteen percent. So, so, so it's not it's not all doom and gloom, but there are financial stability risks, as we say. Now, on Russia, look, the most solid fundamentals among EM, a country with no debt whatsoever, no net debt at all, a country that has full coverage of its money base by gold. So practically is on a gold standard and with very undervalued exchange rate by, by all metrics. And at the same time, it is hard to recommend to fade the current weakness because there is this heightened political uncertainty about what happens with Donetsk and Lugansk, whether they'll be declaring independence or there'll be negotiation towards a more flexible federation, whether there'll be reopening of the water supply for Crimea or Russia will have to practically make an incursion to secure that water supply. So there are, there are serious issues. And the hopes now are that with Biden reaching out to talk to Putin, there might be an opportunity for a grand bargain on all those. And today, of course, the sanctions were announced. They are marginally hawkish, but the forward is a lot more hawkish, right? So what is implied as potential further sanction contingencies are more hawkish. So, so all that, I think I would quote somebody who I highly respect, uh, Professor Mearsheimer uh, from University of Chicago, one of the key people on, on geopolitics who I follow. He said, basically, he was talking about the Trump administration a couple of years ago, and he said that it is very difficult for U.S. to engage with three large countries at the same time, speaking about China, Iran, and Russia. So he thought that China is obviously the big priority because of various kind of uh, factors and that eventually U.S. will have to disengage with Iran and with Russia at some point. So I see, despite the big risks that we are facing over the next few weeks in Ukraine, 
I see silver lining in the fact that uh, Biden is offering a meeting and that also he there was some talk that he wants to put a dog on the National Security Council. So it is not all doom and gloom for Russia as well. And then uh, round it off with India. India, very important. I am extremely bullish and positive on growth and technology, particularly the, the kind of the byproduct of, of great power competition and the fact that India is going to be more integrated with you know US, Japan, Australia on the macro side, technology transfer and so on. So I think that this is a major positive medium term. Short term, the COVID epidemic, indeed, very worrying. The double mutation variant, which is behind the very intense epidemic, is a matter of concern. We might, at this pace of growth, without a hard lockdown, we might see shocking numbers, daily numbers from India over the next 10, 15 days. So the currency has responded. Usually currencies respond in the first two weeks of a COVID epidemic surge with weakness, 3 to 5%. And I would say in India, there might be Uh, like one stage where people say that was it, but then if the numbers keep pushing to levels which are very uh, worrying, we might have a second period of weakness. But then if, if after this, I think will be again quite interesting, you know, investment opportunity. And, and would you have a favorite asset for India? Is it the currency? Is it bonds, equities? I still prefer equities to bonds, to be honest, uh, simply because, you know, nominal growth uh, rebound this, this year is going to be twice the bond yield and you have the strong demographic. So I, I would maintain bullish equities view. And by the way, in bear bond markets, most emerging market equities actually do well. The last bear bond market, 2003, 2006, Russia was doing 54% per year on average, South Africa, 25%. So, you know, it's not all doom and gloom, even in if, if the global inflation trend has turned. Yeah, no, that's great. Now, just there's one or two topics that you mentioned early on that I wanted to come back to, just le less about markets, just more kind of conceptual. Uh, one was this your point about freedom versus prosperity. So if you look at 2020, you look at kind of the West's response versus, say, China, or say, US versus China. And China, you know, did really well. I mean, they built hospitals in, in you know, in a week or two, you know, they, they managed to contain it all. The US was completely dys dysfunctional. And, you know, one way of looking at this is, you know, for military perspective, you know, this was like a biological attack on multiple countries. And the US is supposed to have, you know, the most powerful military in the world. And, you know, they should be sort of prepared for this. And yet it, it didn't kind of work out. So on multiple dimensions, you know, the balance is kind of tilting towards China rather than the US. I mean, how, how, how do you kind of, you know, think about this? I mean, yes, it is, it is very concerning. And obviously, looking at the facts over the last year, you can make the conclusions that a society that can at will limit personal freedoms in a very immediate, fast and effective way is more adept to do well in such an environment or under such uh, situations. At the same time, I don't want to use the, the war uh, illusion because we are not in a kind of in a full war mode. The world is in an intense, probably sharp elbows competition mode. And again, I would say the war is moving from actual conflict to a uh, virtual conflict in the same way as many things of everything, right? So the case for the liberal system is the concept of anti-fragility, which was developed by or expressed most precisely by Nassim Taleb. And it means that you can lose battles, but by losing those battles, you're learning. And when you're learning, that makes you stronger. So think about what is the effect. US, yes, it was chaos, but we do have the mRNA technology, which can allow us to do a, a fast development response in future situations like that, right? We then learned another lesson that the vaccine manufacturing infrastructure should be part of the defense complex. It shouldn't be scattered around the world, and it shouldn't be insufficient. It should be ample. So these are two very, very important lessons that we have learned and that, that will, will make the system generally stronger and more robust in the future. So uh, again, I would say that that's the strength 
basically of the liberal system. The strength of the liberal system is its sustainability. Yeah, point well taken. And then the other one was around your adventures in AI and machine learning that you've been engaged in. Now, during our conversation a few times, you've, you've talked about priors and your econometric analysis. And in some ways, that's the old world, <laughs> econometrics, and there's the new world of machine learning, you could say. I mean, what, what are you gaining from you know, AI and machine learning that you don't have with the more traditional kind of finance tools? First, let me tell you, it's, it's exactly the same world, but with a new packaging. We are still doing basically logistics or time series regressions. We're doing classification versus time series regressions. And I would say the results between one and the other, uh, obviously the, the, the neural network modeling has achieved tremendous results in certain classification areas like image recognition. But in terms of time series analysis or analyzing complex systems that have random shocks, I am not sure whether, whether the jury is out, what, which, one, which one is more transparent, more versatile. And the key benchmark there is self-driving cars. You know, the self-driving car information process and technology is the closest to what we know in the markets. The markets obviously are miles more complex than any road situation, right? And you see that how hard it is to, to, to get to the self-driving car. So anyone who tells you that they have the ultimate solution for the markets, unless they, they work for the medallion fund, they pro you probably have to take it with a pinch of salt. But the reality is that I think there are substantial, basically improvements in the way we can model complex decision-making processes. And we have to be better at disaggregating and identifying the different patches of environment or different, I, I would say, segments of dependencies and correlations. If we can achieve that, identify the regime we are in better, the predictability and the efficacy of AI technologies for investment or any type of decision-making process would be a lot better. So if, you, if I can compare a self-driving car situation, it will be a totally different model if you're driving on dry road with no cars on a Sunday morning, 6 a.m. It should be a completely different model if you're driving at uh, 6 p.m. coming back on Sunday in a snowstorm where everybody's trying to get, to, to get back to the city right after a long break and maybe a few glasses of wine more than necessary on lunch. So uh, these two regimes are completely different. And in the markets, the biggest mistake that I have seen most often is that people trying to put a time series uh, of certain length through a neural network or to model it econometrically without any differentiation by factors, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes that's a great point. And you know, moving moving on to more personal questions now. You know, what one question I have is: you're obviously very well read. You read the literature, ac academic literature. Your your researcher by sort of approach in terms of the way you look at markets. I mean, how, how do you keep on top of research and all this information that gets thrown at you, Twitter and academic papers? I mean, what's your approach? I think it is a routine and discipline, basically. It's, it's, it's all about that. Just uh, devoting small segments of the day or the week to certain tasks. I have programmed, for example, you'll find that funny, but one of the nerdy things, I programmed an RSS crawler that would go around various you know, institutions that produce working papers and collect basically the latest links and email them to me every 24 hours. So I have an email particularly for that, which gives me all the new stuff that's been published over the past 24 hours. And I don't look at it every day. Not every day there is something interesting being published, but at least once a week I go and scroll and, and check the things that are relevant mostly to my work. That's one way. So you, you really, if you find some clever way to make technology work for you, to create some alert filter, I think this is the key. I think Twitter is very useful and particularly by creating lists on subjects and identifying the key credible people that would express opinions or provide links on that subject and add them to these lists and just keep checking those lists based on, on, uh, on your interest. I think that is something which is very helpful. And then again, there are periods where markets and information are more intense and you have to process more. And then there are periods where things kind of calm down and are quiet then you can focus on some other stuff, watch the occasional film or distract yourself a bit with something else. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And finally, are there any books that have really influenced you over your career? 
or any books recently that you've really enjoyed? You know, there are so many. If I mention one particular book published in 1860, called, I think was called 30 Years in Wall Street. It is quite impressive. It basically, the way it starts reading, you really think it was written five or 10 years ago. You see how developed US and what kind of history and tradition US has in finance and investment when you go there. So I think another very important book which have influenced my geopolitical thinking has been Economic Interdependence and War by Del Coleman, Princeton University Press, which analyzes the outlook for trade and and, uh, how that influences whether a country becomes a disruptor or is kind of a peaceful and positive country. So those countries that have negative outlook for their trade and trade prices or volumes, they can become more bellicose. A very interesting analysis spanning over 200 years. In terms of scientific inquiry, epistemology, I would very much recommend a super enjoyable book called The Ashtray by Errol Morris. This is uh, is phenomenal because he takes a very headlong confrontational challenge with Thomas Kuhn. It is a book about the tribalism in science and the brilliant minds that have been kicked out of the system. And it is a whole different area of personal inquiry to try to look at those outsiders who may have tremendous insights and solutions and not disregard them and not disrespect them because they have been thrown out of the mainstream, right? I think that is fascinating. One other guy who is this and has influenced me a lot is Eliezer Yudkowsky, who is at the Institute of Artificial Intelligence. And uh, he's one of the key workers on Bayesian rationality. Again, kind of often accused or, or disregarded as a guru type of figure, but I think with tremendous insights, I would very strongly recommend reading The 12 Virtues of Rationality, which are on his website, which is quasi a Zen type of samurai, very, very funny bit of, or insightful actually as well, bit of text, which for anyone who deals with forecasting or dealing with uncertainty are of great daily help. That's great. No, they're great, great selection. I don't think I've heard of any of them, I don't think. So that's that's great. I can add some new books to my, my list. And if, if people wanted to follow your thinking or your work, is there any way they can do that or not? I'm not sure if, if any of your materials in the public domain or not. At the moment, I would say not really, maybe in future. But yeah, at the moment, I do kind of more internal proprietary stuff. I haven't found the right formal platform to do this at the moment. Yeah, but I hope that in future it will be possible. But, uh, you know, I appreciate very much uh, the opportunity to talk to you and to share all those views and insights. And uh, it has been a real pleasure. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Boris. And hopefully you'll have a very successful year in markets. Hopefully. Once again, we'd like to thank Moonfair for sponsoring this episode. Moonfair is now launching its Moonfair Growth Equity Portfolio product to make private equity growth and tech funds easier than ever for individual investors to access. The days of buying the post-IPO pop are over. Since the early 2000s, the typical time to IPO has increased from three years to 10 years or more, according to a Carlyle Group analysis of research conducted by Texas University's professors Keith Brown and Kenneth Williams. Their work found that investors in these private companies claim 80% of the value created. And Moonfair's growth equity portfolio allows investors to capture much of this value. Growth investors are one of the most interesting pockets of private equity. They target companies, oftentimes that are making bold, futuristic bets that will redefine gigantic industries or invent new ones altogether. These products have also found product market fit and begun scaling rapidly, mitigating some of the risk of early stage venture capital. Fund managers from EQT to BlackRock have launched growth-focused strategies in the last months. Moonfair is putting it at the fingertips of individual investors from minimums as low as $60,000, £50,000 or €50,000. To get started, please visit moonfair.com forward slash macrohive. That's moonfair.com forward slash macrohive and create your free profile. There you can also check out Moonfair's library of white papers exploring topics around private markets investing, along with some of Moonfair's favorite episodes of the podcast. Completing a Moonfair profile is completely free and without any obligations and will give you access to Moonfair's platform where you can see which funds are available, check due diligence, documentation, and connect with Moonfair's investor solutions team. It's well worth it. I'd recommend you go onto the site, type in moonfair.com forward slash macrohive, and then you'll be able to look under the hood and get to see what these private equity funds 
really are doing. With that, thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a five-star rating and a nice comment. And let other people know about the show. We'd really be grateful. Also, sign up to become a member of MacroHive at MacroHive.com. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.